Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Have you ever been in a situation where there's something very important, it's vital that this thing gets accomplished? And maybe you're not good at that, you feel very inadequate, or perhaps you're simply overwhelmed with other things that you don't have the time, perhaps the resources, and this is causing you a great deal of anxiety, a great degree of concern. You are burdened for that, and you don't know what to do. And then suddenly someone steps in and says, don't worry about it. I've got it. I'll take control. I will accomplish it. And you know what's great about that? If that person has the ability, has the connections, the resources, the time, everything, and you rely upon him, you know that this person is trustworthy, that you can depend upon him and his word. Well, when he says it, it's going to be done. And that can give such a person such a degree of contentment, all of those feelings, that stress, anxiety, that burden, everything is removed. And when it's finally accomplished, you have such a great feeling of joy and thanksgiving and appreciation for that one who handled that for you. Well, in essence, this is what God has said over and over to his people, those who are in a covenantal relationship with him. So frequently, God, what he has called us to do, he wants to do it simply through us. He will make the resources available. He will give us the ability, and he will be working in us and through us to bring it about. And in the end, what does he want? What he deserves. Praise and thanksgiving and worship because he is indeed the Lord over all. Now, that is a simple lesson to understand. But it's very difficult for most human beings to take hold of it and live in light of it. No, we tend to trust others before we trust God. Oftentimes, we want to keep things in our own hands, under our own domain, rather than to bring ourselves and every aspect of the very essence of who we are under the authority of God. And when we fail to submit to God, trust Him, rely upon Him, depend upon Him, and walk under His authority, we are making a foolish decision. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 10. The book of Isaiah and chapter 10. Now, here we see that there is some good news. God is going to bring change. What type of change? The answer shouldn't surprise us. A prophetic change. A change in light of his prophetic word. Learn a principle. And that is the promises that, that I am going to have are promises that God teaches me about them and how I can receive them through prophetic revelation. When we look at the history of the children of Israel, their promises are connected to prophetic instruction and nothing has changed. There is so much prophecy in the scripture, not just in the books of prophecy, but also in places like the book of Psalms and 
we see it throughout the new covenant. So let's begin the book of Isaiah chapter 10, and we're going to begin in verse 20. Notice what it says. And it shall come about on that day. Be'yom ha'hu. Now, probably for most of you, you don't know too much Hebrew. But I hope that that phrase, be'yom ha'hu, has become familiar to you. On that day. It is almost without exception. Always used in regard to judgment coming. And the outcome of that judgment for those who are covenantal people, those who are faithful to the word of God, that judgment is going to bring about good consequences, great results. And this is what we see here in chapter 10. Now, the context we need to remember, because what empire has been emphasized so far in the book of Isaiah, especially beginning with Isaiah chapter 7, is Assyria. Israel, and especially that northern kingdom, had great to fear from Assyria without God. Without God, there is no hope. And we know that the northern kingdom called Israel fell to Assyria in 721, 722 B.C. And the fear was the same thing would happen to Judah. But under the leadership of a godly king, King Hizkiyahu, that is Hezekiah, and because of prophetic revelation from Isaiah, the southern kingdom, oh, they suffered. They saw certain cities fall to Assyria, but not Jerusalem. And that northern kingdom fell, but the southern Judah did not. Jerusalem did not fall into the hands of the Assyrians. And we're learning truth about why not in this passage. So again, verse 20, And it shall come about on that day, lo yusif od, which means not to continue any longer. As I said, this foreshadows a change that is coming. God is not going to continuously allow his people to be oppressed. There is deliverance coming, and the way to find deliverance is through prophetic truth. And this is going to be seen without any question in a moment. So not any more will the remnant of Israel continue, nor the pleitat bet Yaakov. Now the word pleita is a word for a escape. It's related to the word we all today hear the term refugee. And refugee usually speaks about one who has escaped a bad situation in one country and has come to another. But the key word here is escaping. So the remnant which has escaped, the remnant of Israel and the, the one who is the refugee from the house of Jacob. And that refugee is understood in the plural, it's written in the singular, but it's understood referring to a group, a group of refugees. And what are these going to do? Well, notice what it says. Lehi sha'en al makehu. What's that? Well, these, remember, they're not going to continue to do something. What caused them to be in trouble was that they relied, they trusted, they depended upon the one who struck them. Oftentimes we see how there was a tendency for Israel to depend upon Egypt, to make alliances as a northern kingdom did with Ashur, that is Assyria thinking that if we enter into a covenant with them, a peace treaty, then everything's going to be okay. That was false teaching. So we have here, no longer will such a behavior 
continue. Not for the one who is going to be the remnant of Israel and the one who escapes from the house of Jacob. No longer are they going to rely upon the one who strikes him, but, and here's the key, but they will rely upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And notice this last phrase, they and met in truth. So here's the change. They are going to stop trusting in man. Stop relying upon political alliances and begin to trust in the truth of God. And primarily here, we see this truth referring to the scriptures, certainly the law of Moses, the revelation of the wisdom writings like the book of Proverbs and Psalms and such. But, but most scholars agree that the truth that they're referring to are the prophetic promises that men like Isaiah the prophet made. So it's this prophetic revelation that is going to give them the truth that they're going to trust in and find deliverance. Move now to verse 21. The remnant of, of Israel is going to do something. It says, the remnant will return. And the remnant of Yaakov, or Jacob. So we hear, see here two places, back to back, where the word sha'ar, those that remain, the remnant. The remnant will return. The remnant of Jacob. This is important because it foreshadows this, this returning to the land. That they're not going to forsake the land. That they're going to return. And notice more. They return to, in this case, to the faithful one, it says here, to the mighty God, El Gibor. Realizing that true power is with God. So they're going to return to God. And this all speaks about a spirit of repentance. And don't miss the connection between repentance and trusting in God, specifically in the truth of God. Verse 22. For if the, your people Israel will be as the sand of the sea. Now, I want to go into something that for probably most of you, not going to be all that relevant, but it begins with the phrase, ki em. And this phrase, usually, usually, if it's an idiom together, it means rather. But notice, if you look at the Hebrew text, we see a marking, a grammatical marking that tells us that it's not the expression here, ki em, but rather ki and the word aim is related to the next phrase. So we don't translate it rather, but we translate it. Because if your people Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, notice it says, a remnant will return with it. Meaning, if Israel is numerous, only a small remnant is going to return. Now, how should we understand that? Well, most scholars are correct. When they see Israel being like the sand of the sea over the generations. From the time of, of Jacob's birth onward, there's been a lot of Jewish people. But compared to that number, which is indeed a fulfillment of God's promise, that the nation of Israel will be numerous as the sand upon the sea. But we should not expect, based upon scriptural revelation, we should not expect all of them to return to God and be part of the kingdom. No, he says very carefully, Sha'ar, Sha'ar, only a remnant of them will return to the Lord God. Only a remnant. And notice what it says at the end of verse 22. 
kilayon harutz shotef tataka, which means a determined destruction. And this word for destruction means an end. So an end has been determined and it's going to flow forth. It is going to be like, like a, a flood that just quickly passes. And what's the outcome? Well, this determined end that's going to quickly pass, it is going to bring about righteousness. And this tells us that God is most concerned with righteousness. What God does is to bring about a righteous end. And here's some wisdom for us. When I'm in a situation, I need, if I'm going to be on the right side, if, if my desires are going to be fulfilled, I better desire righteousness. I must choose what will be the righteous outcome. Otherwise, I'm going to be putting myself against God. And I'm not going to have a lasting success. Oh, there may be a temporal success. People may for a moment, but when that predetermined end, and that's what we can understand, when God brings about the end that he has promised, it is going to come quickly, like floods come flooding through, and the outcome is going to be righteousness. Verse 23. He wants to emphasize this, so again, he uses that same phrase, but a different construction of that, that root. And he says, for a determined end, now he goes from the masculine phrase to a feminine phrase, but same, same uh, root words. For a determined end, the Lord God of hosts, he makes in the midst of all the land, and that can be all the earth. So God doing this, and here's the reference for us, what we need to glean from this. God is doing this specifically with his covenant people. Here he's talking about Israel, the house of Jacob. He's referred to this twice. But it's going to have implications in the midst of all the earth, not just the land of Israel but all the earth. So God's determined end for Israel is going to happen. It is going to have great implications for all of his creation. Look now to verse 24. Therefore, thus said the Lord God of hosts, here again, thus said. This is, and it's futuristic, but it's put in the past. Why? That we can rely upon it. We can depend upon this. It's as good as done, in other words. Therefore, thus said the Lord God of hosts, do not fear my people. And who does he speak to? His people? Notice what it says. Yoshet Sion. God is speaking. My people are the one. Yoshet Sion, the inhabitant of Sion. Now, I've shared with you the term Zion or Zion is a kingdom word. Every time that word appears in the scripture, it has kingdom implications to it. So his kingdom people are the ones who dwells, their thoughts, their hope, their dreams. Everything that makes them them is connected to a kingdom hope. That phrase, kingdom hope, is so vital in our understanding. He says, do not fear from who? Assure Assyria. For with his rod, he will strike. And with his staff, he will lift up against you in the way of Egypt. Now, what does this mean, but Derek Mitzrayim? Well, very simply, he's speaking here, one of the people to remember you know, Egypt was a big problem for you. You were in bondage there for 430 years. You suffered greatly, and Egypt came to the conclusion that Egypt wanted to destroy the children of Israel, that they would not remain, and that's why all the male offspring were to be cast into the Nile River to annihilate 
this concept, this one of Israel. But did Egypt succeed? No. So neither will Assyria. They will go the way of Egypt. Now verse 25. For a little more, and then it has another word for small, tiny. So most translations say for a very little more, and what will happen? Vechala. Now, this is a word that we talked about earlier for end. It has appeared now in three forms. In a noun form that is masculine, a noun form that is feminine, and now a verb. But this word is being emphasized, repeated over and over in the text. And what is going to bring about this desired end? Well, he tells us, for the wrath and my anger will end on to their destruction. So what he's saying is this, I will bring it in. My wrath and my anger is going to, to come to an end with their destruction. Whose destruction? Assyria. But realize, this all is a paradigm. It is foreshadowing what's going to happen in the future. What Isaiah does so frequently is this. He gives a situation, futuristic, last days, or messianic in its implications, whether it's for Messiah's first coming or second coming. And then he gives an additional prophecy related, tied to it, but in his day. And when that secondary prophecy is fulfilled, the purpose of it is to tell us, you can trust in the last day promise. So it's to build faith. It's to tell us that God is reliable, that we can trust him and not be disappointed. Verse 26. They or a love will rise up upon him. Who's doing this? The Lord. The Lord of hosts will rise up. It will cause him to, to be awakened. And who's that? Well, who are we talking about? Assure. Specifically, we're speaking about the king of Assyria and his army. The Lord of hosts will will. Wake him up with a whip, with a striking, like what? As the striking of Midian. Now, this is, and there's reasons that we can be assured for this. If you study Judges chapters 6 and 7, there's references here. Midian was the opponent of Gideon, that is Gideon. And God moved how? He moved against a great army. Read, I would instruct you, encourage you, exhort you. Read this great two chapters of the book of Judges. Judges chapter 6 and 7. It is to instill faith in Gideon, and in doing so, when we understand it, it will instill faith into me and to you. And we see that God did it not through a greater army, but with 300 men, with shofars, with ram horns, and with, with lamps, with candles inside. Something that we would not expect. But that's how God defeated this vast army of the Midianites who had joined with them the sons of the east. It was a massive army. Israel was greatly outnumbered to the extent God said, send the soldiers home. I only used 300 of them. Amazing what God did. And this is what we should see. Look again, verse 26. The Lord of hosts will awaken him with the whip like the striking of Midian at the rock of Orev. Orev, if you read all of, of this passage that I recommended, Judges, and in Judges chapter 7 towards the end, 
we see that Gideon pursued the enemy and made it all the way to a rock where one Orev was put to death. And this is what it's talking about, the rock of Erev, unto, notice something else, the, the striking, the rod upon the sea. Now, this takes us back to Mate Moshe, which is the, the staff or the rod of Moses that God gave to him to do miracles, and he lifted it up. And what happened? That miracle at the Red Sea. And then finally it says, and he will lift it up like the way of Egypt. So again, we see how Egypt, don't trust in Egypt. Egypt was destroyed. Egypt, Assyria will go to the manner to the same way that Egypt went to. Verse 27. We began with this expression, Be'yom Ha'ho, and we'll end with this verse. We're going to continue to the next section, but this passage ends in verse 27 with the same phrase. And it shall come about that day, that judgment day in other words, when he will remove his suffering from upon his shoulder. Now, literally, it makes it personal. God speaking to Israel. And he says, the implication is, he will remove his suffering from upon you. That is, God will re remove the burden, the suffering of, of Assyria from your shoulder and his yoke from upon your neck. And then notice the last phrase. I want to say it in Hebrew because there's many different ways that it's translated. We have vehubal. Ol mipane shaman. Now, what is this? Well, there's no disagreement. The word hubal, it's in the passive, and it has to do with something being destroyed. So it speaks about destruction, something being destroyed, and what is that? The yoke uh, that's going to be destroyed that was upon the children of Israel this burden, and it's destroyed. Now, many translate it uniquely, but it says, mipane, shaman. Shaman is oil. It's the fatness, the, the best oil. And this word is usually in used in regard to anointing oil. So the Spirit is going to come upon Israel. And that's going to bring about the defeat of the enemy. See, when we're in the spirit or the spirit's in us, the enemy can't do anything. It's when we grieve, quench, hinder the Holy Spirit that that empowers the enemy. So that New Testament principle is certainly being taught here. Well, let's move on to the second session or section of our, our passage beginning with verse 28. And this all speaks about the futility of the king of Assyria. That he is going to come close, but he's not going to be successful. In the same way that the Antichrist is going to come close, he's going to kill two-thirds of the Jewish people in the last days, but that remnant, Sha'ar, as it says here, will be delivered. Verse 28. Now, most of the places here, a good portion of them, we don't know. Some we do, but some we don't. But they're all locations, the one that we do know, are all locations close to Jerusalem. And it simply is a reference to Sen Kharif, coming close to Jerusalem, very close, laying siege upon the city, but not being successful. Verse 28. And he came unto Ayat, and he passed into Migron, to Mikmash. And at Mikmash, he placed his vessels. So at that place, I'm going to say it correct, Mikmash. At Mikmash, he deposited, he had a storage place, a armory, we might say, for his weapons. And he passed on through a passage 
and I translate it literally, it's the word to pass, and the word for passage is from that same root. Of ru ma bara, in a passageway he passed, and he lodged at a place called Geva. Here again, we're not familiar with that, but we're told that it's a place near Jerusalem. So a lodging place was for, he says, for us at Geva. And because of that, Rama was exceedingly fearful. She trembled. Rama, we do know. It's a place close to Jerusalem. And Rama trembled. And Givat Shoal, another place, there's a neighborhood of Jerusalem called Givat Shoal today. Givat Shoal fled away, meaning the people who were close to Jerusalem left. And your voice cried out, verse 30, your voice cried out. Whose voice? Bat Galim. And it was heard, listened, it was heard all the way to Elisha and to the poor neighborhoods of Anatot. Anatot as well. By the way, Jerusalem, or Jeremiah was from this town as well, near Jerusalem. And it was a poor place or had poor neighborhoods, and all of this was heard there. Verse 31. And Mad Mena, no one knows that place, but it wandered, meaning it, it went away as well. It, it became no man's. And the dwellers of Gavin, here again, we don't know where this is. They were gathered up, and what it probably means is that they gathered things up, and they fled as well. Verse 32, speaking about uh, the king of, uh, king of Assyria. And one day he, he paused at Noph. Now, we all know the priest of Noph. This is a, a stronghold for priestly families to dwell there. And this is because they wanted to be close to Jerusalem. So, Od Hayom, for one day is the implication he paused at Nov, and then he shook his fist, literally his hand, he shook his hand at Mount of the House of Zion. So Har Habayit, the kingdom mountain, Jerusalem where the temple stood, he mocked it, in other words, at Giv'at Yerushalayim, at the hill of Jerusalem. Verse 33, Behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, what will he do? He will basically cut off the branch with an axe and the exalted high places will be cut down. And the ones who are haughty, that is, who have a high spirit, who are prideful, they are going to be brought low. So what God is promising here is this. All these places are near Jerusalem. Assyria, this king, Sennacherib, he's going to get there, but he's not going to be successful because God is going to defeat this prideful one in a moment. Verse 34, this will be our last verse where it says, and he will strike the thicket of the force with an axe. Now, this is a different word for axe, but it's the same idea. And the force speaks about, and notice that Lebanon is mentioned. Lebanon was a force that was thick with trees. And that's what it says here, that he is going to strike with an axe this thick force. And Lebanon, Lebanon is seen as earthly glory. This earthly glory of Lebanon, it says a mighty one is going to cause it to fall. It will fall because of a mighty one. And who's this one that's called the Adir? Well, this is a reference most scholars see to Messiah. So in the same way that God, through prophetic truth that was given to Isaiah, and that it was King Hezekiah that executed it, so 
Hezekiah is a paradigm, a, a prototype, we might say, for Messiah. Now, he's not Messiah, but his trusting in prophetic words, the instructions, is similar to how Messiah is going to trust and obey the prophetic revelation to bring about a future victory. So again, in the same way that Assyria was destroyed, who came against Jerusalem, so too we can expect in the last days that great army that the Antichrist will assemble will come near in the same way that Assyria came near and entered into Judah and surrounded Jerusalem. But Assyria was not successful, nor was or nor will be the Antichrist. God's prophetic revelation will prove to be true and there will be deliverance and there will be many refugees from, from that time that come out and will enter into the kingdom of God. These are the truths that Isaiah, the marvelous truths that Isaiah are sharing with his people. And the reason why a deer, that word is usually seen as a reference to Messiah. It forms the basis, the connection between what we've just studied and what we're going to study next week. One of the greatest prophetic prophecies, the book of Isaiah chapter 11 that speaks clearly about Messiah and giving us insight on his identity, his personhood and his work. Well, we'll close with that until next week. May God bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.